Um, so, Julie Maharatu is a challenging subject. I have been working pretty hard to wrap my mind around this lady's work. Um, she is a MacArthur Genius Award-winning artist. Um, if you know anything about it, that, that is quite an achievement in and of itself. Uh, she received that in uh, 2005. And the, the philosophical underpinnings of, of her work quite challenging and, and um, I've listened to a number of talks by her and it's, it's always been illuminating, shall we say. Um, so basically what I'm gonna say at this stage of the game is her work is really abstracted landscape on a larger, large scale. It's a kind of global perspective using aerial views in a language of dots, lines, symbols, smudges, color forms, um, these kind of multi-layered paintings integrate social, political, racial, ecological concerns into the images. And I'm going to expand a lot more on that as I talk more about this work. Um, so uh, Julie Maharatu creates new forms and finds unexpected resonances in her mixed media paintings, drawing from the histories of art and human civilization. Her imagery has representational origins, but remains steadfastly abstract. This mid-career survey presents an overview of 30 large scale paintings and 40 works on paper, which are also fairly large scale. Um, through abstracted architecture, landscape, scale, and most recently figuration, she examines how forces such as migration, capitalism, climate change impact human populations and possibilities. Maharatu's canvases incorporate elements of technical drawing of urban buildings, linear illustrations of city grids, weather charts, uh, migration charts, all kinds of um, uh, information that, that is, is abstracted and used as sign and symbol. Um, so instead of using kind of formal perspective, she uses multiple points of view and perspective ratios constructed um, to construct flattened city images of city life. Her drawings are similar to her paintings with many layers forming complex abstracted images of social interaction, on a global scale. Um, the relatively smaller scale uh, drawings are an opportunity to explore um, many different ideas in, in, in those pieces. So what we have here on, on the left is a, a painting from uh, 2004. It, it's uh, 107 by 140 inches, so it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a good 12 feet wide and, and you know, a, quite a reach to get up there to the top. Now, you know, in this piece, it's kind of free floating flags and pendants and archeological structures in there. Um, um, the, there's, there's movement and, and um, a, a lot of different elements that I'm gonna explore a lot more deeply in, in other pieces. So I'm just gonna keep moving on for right now. Well, Larry, yes. somebody had a comment. They say yeah. it's an interesting piece and you can see the three dimensionality of the stadium. Absolutely, yep. Um, so Maharatu was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1970, uh, the first child of an 
uh, Ethiopian college professor of geography and uh, an American Montessori teacher. They fled the country in 1977 to escape political turmoil and moved to East Lansing, Michigan for her father's teaching position on um, economic geography at Michigan State University. So it's very interesting how that feeds into the imagery in her work. <clears throat> um, Maharatu received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Kalamazoo College at Kalamazoo, Michigan. Then she attended um, Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, um, where she earned her master's. Um, she shares her studio with her partner, artist Jessica Rankin. Um, her mother-in-law is author and poet Lily Brent, and I haven't had a chance to check out her work, so I don't know much about her. Um, but uh, Jessica uh, Rankin um, is, is a really wonderful artist herself. And below is a picture of, of uh, the, the young Julie. Uh, that was from 1992. So she was at Kalamazoo at that point. Okay. And so 1996, these are uh, some of the migration flow chart maps that, that she, was, she was doing. These are on mylar. So basically what she would do is do these on on transparent um, plastic sheets and put them onto um, an overhead projector and project them onto the canvas. And, you know, this is a little bit similar to things that we've already seen from somebody like Jasper Johns, who used to take old masters paintings and take tracings off of them or Picasso and take tracings off of that and project those and use those as abstract shapes. So here we have the result of some of that. Um, so you can see um, the, how those big abstract shapes in these pieces translate into these color forms in this slightly later piece. And then you can see the layering of the perspectival business going on in the background. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you more of that in some more pieces. I want to keep moving because there's a lot to see. Um, okay, so um, the lower left is, is um, Maharatu painting outdoors in her um, upstate uh, New York uh, outside the barn. Uh, in Denison Hill, um, and that's from 2001. And you can see her using using this um, the airbrush to um, paint on, on the underpainting of one of her pieces. And then um, in 07, there's there's um, her son climbing up the scaffold to to see her while she's working on one of her large scale pieces called Black City, which was actually um, executed at the studios um, uh, in Harlem um, while she was artist in residence there. Um, it's also a piece derived from images from Detroit, I believe. I'm not 100% certain about that, but I seem to recall that. Um, and on the right, you see uh, her standing uh, in front of a couple of her paintings at uh, Marion Goodman, her gallery in New York um, uh, in 1919, I mean, 2019, 1919, where am I? 2019, 2020. Um, and below is one of her partner's pieces. Uh, Jessica Rankin um, uh, integrates traditional, traditionally uh, methods traditionally identified as feminine pursuits, embroidery and needlework into her kind of stain paintings that are these acrylic stain pieces. And those, those patches of brighter color 
are actually uh, stitched into the canvas. And, you know, she's using mental maps with codes and signs and symbols, exploring ideas of memory, intuition, and interpretation along the same lines as Julie. They, they, they share those, those interests, though very different approaches. Okay. And now you can see this kind of global map. It's, it's um, the, the perspectival lines at the top kind of receding into it, but it's kind of, you get the sense of this, this, you know, this kind of looking down at the earth from, from an aerial view and these, you know, dots on the map kind of locating certain events or, or, you know, they're very enigmatic as far as like what this is about though, though she keeps records of everything that she's doing and everything that she's describing in these pieces and not trying to hide any of that information. Um, it's very interesting and there, these things are done in, these earlier pieces from 2003, these are very precise. That the the layering is very precise. That the um, the elements of the line drawing and the and the large patches of color and all of that are you know mechanically um, uh, really uh, particular in how she lays them in there. And, and that layering is very important to the piece. Big, again, 95 by 119, which, you know, basically it's, it's, it's like nine and a half, nine and a half or eight and a half by 10 feet. Um, okay. And here, here is a, a detail which lets you see, you know, there are these kind of staircase-like um, uh, mechanical drawings in there. And then there's, there's um, perspectival areas that look like windows and sides of buildings and things like that. There's also kind of, you know, chart-like lines um, uh, so this is, this is again repeated. Now the color is very subdued, but really well thought out and beautifully done. Um, and again, so you see what the sort of source is for these shapes that she's creating. So she's, you know, on, on the, on the lower right is, is uh, what New York City could look like with sea level rise. And she would take that chart and kind of use that as the abstract shapes that are going into these paintings. And, you know, the, the, you know, the buildings uh, of lower Manhattan is again, something that she would integrate into, into her painting and use that as a, uh, as another layer of structure. Okay. So just to give you a little context, you know, on the on the upper right is a, a Kandinsky from uh, 1923, and you can see how these uh, geometric forms, the linear shapes, the kind of mechanical um, uh, drawing. Um, uh, use was in practice in his work. Um, and below is a chart of the kind of evolution, a, a progression in uh, Pet Mondrian's work. So you get how he evolved from the tree through various stages into his more and more abstract geometric configurations. 
So Julie is developing this kind of uh, lang visual language out of these charts and out of these maps and the, the aerial views and all that and, and using that as part of the, the, um, the spatial juxtapositions that she's doing in these pieces. The, the very um, formal in these early pieces, they get more and more abstracted and looser as they go further and we'll see more of that very soon. And right here, we see, you know, this is from 2002. So you can see that the, um, the ink lines are a lot more, the, the marking is a lot looser. They, they're, you know, smudged and, and, um, and kind of smeared around and put in and erased out. Um, interesting technique that she's using in these pieces that, you know, basically the calligraphic ink that she's using is something which is water soluble. So she can put it on there and take it off and, and blend it and do different things to it and then layer over it with a, um, a transparent acrylic medium to make them permanent. Okay, and again, I wanted to bring in uh, some references to history. So there's the constructivists in, in um, Russia, um, Elizinsky and, and um, uh, there, there were a number of others um, that, that were in this school. And basically what it was was flat planes of color creating depth just by the interaction of those colors and the linear element kind of weaving through it. And you can see how this, this would be something that, that Julie would have looked at and integrated into, into her thinking. Um, and then um, the futurists were another influence on, on uh, on Julie, their um, fascination with modernity, with speed, with mechanization. Um, um, it really is kind of the, a, uh, an, an homage to speed. Uh, some of them are even more intense than, than this. I picked out one that I liked. Uh, the others get a little bit, you know, you need your drama me when you're looking at them. Uh, okay. And you can see now, you know, where the, the speed, the motion, the, 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 um, the volatility of, 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 of her work is um, related in some way to the futurists and, and to the constructivist notion of the, the flat planes and color interaction. Um, she's, she's very much into this whole uh, geometric thing. If you look underneath there, it's almost like the, the um, a, a chart of the, the street maps of downtown Manhattan. And you can see this a little bit more detailed in this piece. What I'm focused on and trying to go, go after in my work is not necessarily being informed by other artists' work. It's, it's about trying to understand myself. I keep going back to that, digging deeper into who I am. You have all this experience that determines who you are and, and you can't change that too much. You know, you can only get to know yourself better, understand yourself better and evolve and try to grow. That's how I am with my work, trying to push and understand what I make and why I make it the way I do, why the fascination with certain materials. OK. 
Okay. And display space. Um, complex, really, you know, um, that using a, that that gray ground underneath the whole thing and those those really light lines throughout as as lines of force, but you can see how it's getting more and more complex and more and more layered as she goes on. This is 2006. Um, <clears throat> this is actually the year after she won the uh, the MacArthur uh, Genius Award. Okay. Brightly colored geometric forms float across this canvas, propelling dynamic motion while heightening the illusion of vast space. The artist produced such effects of contrast actively and endlessly expanding by laboriously applying multiple layers of pigment, alternating between ink and acrylic. Through her characteristic use of drawing, the artist built up the surface, mining imagery from maps, diagrams, architectural blueprints, corporate logos. Uh, the result is a visual collision of details, linear, linearly, linearity with bold color, uh, offering the spectator distinct modes of viewing from looking up close and far away. And that's one of the things that I really wanted to say is you really need to see these paintings to get the full sense of what they are because she does do these layers of, of an acrylic um, uh, medium that's a transparent medium. And so it builds up layer after layer on these surfaces. Okay. All right. So, all right. And this is a, um, remember earlier I showed you her on the scaffold um, working on this piece, it, it is a, a fairly big piece. I mean, it's, it's about uh, uh, 14 feet across by um, something like, uh, it's gotta be, well, wait a minute, it's 10 feet high by 16 feet. This is a big one. Um, and you can see here the, the, the density of the marking becoming greater, renegade delirium on, on the uh, left is, um, is much more open, much less detailed. Um, um, and there's a five year difference between these two pieces. So you see the density of the marking, it's, it's getting more atmospheric. Um, the, the mark making, the the um, uh, calligraphic ink is is much looser and and much more gestural in this piece. So you can see how she's putting it on and smearing it off and all that in the process. Okay, and here is Berliner Platz. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, yeah, this was a commission by Deutsche Bank. And um, yeah, this is, this is a, again, a monumental piece. It's 10 by 14 feet or so. Um, layers and layers of, of architectural rendering. And then, and then there's these, these ghost-like images of the white flowing through it that are again, you know, um, uh, from the, the, the flow charts and grids and, and all that, the, the patterning shows. Now she has a, by this time, which is 2009, a crew of people that are working for her. 
So the underpaintings on these pieces, like these pieces that you, these, these shapes that you see, the white shapes that you see floating through the background, there would have been one of her assistants coming in and actually painting in those shapes. And many of the geometric shapes that, that, are, in, that are in the thing were outlined and set up by one of her other assistants. Very methodical work, but she comes in and her handprint is always in there. She's always working the thing and pushing it further. And, and so these, in many ways, are collaborative pieces. Larry? Yes. Uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, how long does it take for her to do a piece, do you know? Uh, it, it depends on the scale of the piece. Some of these pieces take a year to do. Um, some a matter of, of, of months. Um, I know some of the commissions have taken as much as a year and a half. Uh, we, we haven't even gotten, these are, these are relatively small scale in comparison to what we're coming to. Oh my. She, she has done mural size pieces. So, uh, and what was the other question? The other question is the different values of her lines help me see the depth and the layering in her paintings. Yes. In, in, instead uh, of them looking flat. Yeah, they so certainly are multi-dimensional. Right. They're really, they're really, that's one of the wonderful parts and the interesting parts that about these pieces is they're, they are so, there's so much depth created by multiple levels of perspectival stuff, but also by the layering of the marking and all that. So there's, there's so much space in them. Okay, and here we have the Goldman Sachs mural, which is still on display in New York City. Um, on the lower left-hand side, you can see the, um, what it looks like through the window uh, of the Goldman Sachs headquarters. And then you see on the, on the right, basically the scale of a fit of a person walking in front of this thing. So you get the idea of what the magnitude of the piece is. Um, on, on the upper left, I threw in a Miro because I felt that, you know, those shapes and the floating kind of organic shapes that, that Julie is dealing with and the color uh, form relationship had had a kinship with Miro. Um, okay. And again, um, this is a large scale piece, um, part of a um, a quartet of pieces that I'm going to show you next. Um, let's see. And here we are. And below you can see some people standing in front of these monumental scale pieces. So you get some idea of what the scale is. Um, Mogama um, is uh, actually this piece's illumination on the Arab Spring and is named after Cairo's main government building. Uh, the work was created in 2012 and incorporates architectural renderings of Mogama and, and um, uh, as well as other sites of public protest, including Zakati Park, uh, uh, Mes Mescal, I don't know how to pronounce Mescal uh, Square I, in Addis Ababa, um, Moscow's Red Square, Beijing's Tiananmen, so these are all integrated into these into these pieces. So it's kind of a global intersection and connection that presents a combination of her home in New York and uh, her her birthplace of Addis Ababa. Larry, do yes. you know where the Goldman Sachs building is in Manhattan? You know what? I I had that information. I didn't write it down. 
but it is downtown. Okay. You know, down in, in lower Manhattan. Okay. And this is Howell. It is a mural that, that uh, uh, she was uh, commissioned to do for uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, okay, let's see. It examines the competing impulses of annihilation and preservation at the heart of 19th century westward expansion and explores how the Bay Area's history of colonialism, capitalism, class conflict, social protest, and technical innovation have transformed the social and physical landscape with a base layer of distorted digital images of contemporary race riots, street protests, and 19th century depictions of the American West topped with thick luminous layers of paint and ink applied with a brush and spray painting the, uh, and screen, uh, screen printing. Layers of tangles of abstract gestures and erasures reflect the landscape that is in continual reshaping by physical movement struggle, reminding us of the conjoined genealogies of chaos and exploitation and the hope in making the making of the American West. So there's, there's all the business of the Native American displacement and, and all of that information integrated into these contemporary pieces. Again, like I said, she's got a crew. At this point, she had nine, nine people who were working on this thing. I believe the Goldman Sachs mural Somebody was a, said it's near the Freedom Tower. Yes, there you go. And the Goldman Sachs mural um, was a $5 million commission. Took her a year and a half to do. And as I said, she's got a crew. And she's got a crew that were working on this piece too. Basically, there were, I believe, nine. There's one person who's devoted to doing nothing but doing the clear coat layers over these pieces. And another one who comes in and does the the um, the spray painting, the the um, airbrush stenciling into the piece. She orchestrates all of this. And then as you can see in, on the scaffold, she's up there painting. She's always out there with, with a brush in hand. And a lot of that is that calligraphic ink so she can put it down and erase it and move it around and reinforce it. So this is kind of her process that, that she does. And you, you, know, you, get the, you get the sense of scale on these pieces. Well, here's the installation at San Francisco. Remarkable pieces. Okay. So invisible sun, algorithm four, first letter form whatever all that means. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, basically you can see the, the layering is getting, getting to be very atmospheric. There's so much going on underneath the surface and you, you know, it, the, the, the gestural marking, the, the kind of erasers and, and, you know, the, the marks go down and they blur and come off again. Um, the reason I was working earlier with transparency and layering was more analytic in an effort to layer these things one on top of the other. Now there's a little more understanding of the information. I'm actually building in a way where you 
can't easily see through the layers and decipher what's what. It doesn't matter how much of an expert you are in architectural history, it's hard to pick out what is what if everything becomes so congested. And part of that is the intention of, every, of everything just distilling, allowing everything to break up into pieces of dust, vapor, or more atmosphere. So that's the quote from the lady. Julie is quite articulate. I've, I've seen her do a number of interviews and I have uh, a, a, a slew of, of uh, interviews. A couple of them are, are from this Whitney show that's on now. There are others there and, and you can find more. There's dozens of them. She has been interviewed since the early 2000s and, and she's always got something to say. Uh, okay. Now this is different medium. Um, this is um, an aqua tint, um, uh, it's an etching. So these, these are on metal plates, but again, they are large scale. They are 98 by 226 altogether. So this is an enormous plate. And one of the things with this is she has been integrating and in actuality, in a lot of these, she's integrating a, a blurred photographic image underneath the piece. And she's using that more and more as, as time has gone on. So I'll show you a few more of those, but the photographic image is blurred. So you can't really tell what it is. It just creates an, an, an underpaint painting, an underlayment to bring the marking over the top of it. And again, on, on the left, um, using a blurred photograph of the wildfires to create this orange and black background. Um, she's working into it, the, you know, these, these sections of black and, and the, the, the few colors are airbrushed on. And then, and then these, a lot of these strokes are either calligraphic ink or, uh, or spray painted on with a, a really thin nozzle but you get the rhythms that, that are still there. That they're, they're very you know, dense pieces. Her color sensibility is really, um, she, keeps, she keeps a lot of these to a very limited palette. So she can do a lot with, with a few colors. Um, and again, uh, conjured parts, I, Ferguson. So you get, this is Ferguson underneath it. The photograph is in, in there, but it's blurred. So you can't really tell what's going on in there. Um, um, I, I also think of Paul Clay when I look at this, this particular piece and some of these are getting into that kind of um, cryptic language. Um, uh, there's a calligraphy and, and the graffiti um, element comes into it again. Larry? Yes. Uh, somebody wrote that Hanini, Hanini is a Hebrew, wait, is a Hebrew word that means here I am. Uh-huh. Interesting. That's explanation, right. Yes, I like it. Thank you. Uh, so um, this is her working close up. You can see, you know, these you can see this pattern that's in on the canvas. A lot of that is silk screen, but then again, she also uses digital underpaintings on them too, so that they can be digitally produced, you know, like take the photograph and blur it out in Photoshop and then print that out and use that as a base to do these other layers on top. And then you can see the spray paint, you can see how, you know, 
the transparent, translucent layering is going on there. And then she's always in there touching that surface. And here again, you know, we're getting into this business of, of she's very much into Islamic um, derived calligraphy in, in, in some of these pieces. So it's an interesting combination of, of, uh, of photographic and print and spray paint, um, uh, you know, the airbrush and the tracings, the transfer, you know, basically projected transfer of tracings. Um, it's, it's a constantly evolving technique that she's working with. So she can put these, put these marks on like this and remove them. You can see how they're smudged and, and, and that the layer, there's a layer that looks like it's underneath that spray paint, which it actually is. What they would do is come through and use a clear coat over the lower layers of, of the, of the calligraphic markings and then spray, you know, spray paint the clear coat and then spray paint over the top of that. So there's actual, there's actually a film in between the layers of stuff that she's adding onto this. Now, you know, on the one hand, you know that this is about a riot, you know, this is about social turmoil, but at the same time, this is a beautifully painted abstract painting with just incredible layers of marking and um, dimensionality. They're lovely pieces, they're beautifully painted, they're exquisite abstractions with very strong compositional elements, well thought out paintings. Um, if anyone has a, a question, please don't use the raise hand function. Please type it in in chat. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. So often she will do these, these small smaller drawings on, on mylar and then take them and transfer them onto, onto the larger canvases. And here is, you know, Cy Twombly who uses a lot of this calligraphic idea. Um, you know, Roman notes from 1970 was a set of, of lithographs there. They are large scale pieces, but you know, he was drawing from the notion of, of, of um, ancient graffiti, you know, on the walls of the Roman uh, um, cities. Um, who knows what, what, those, what those all were about, but these squiggles and, and, and strokes and mark making was, a definite part of his work and you can see him playing on up up on the upper left with this dimensional um, uh, abstract architectural form so again context um, uh, the Bacchus pieces were, were very late late pieces in his career um, very vulnerable in a certain way. The, the, the marks, the gestures, the, the putting, that, putting that out there and just allowing it to be, allowing that, the, the mark to stand for itself um, was pretty courageous actually in a lot of ways. Um, and then I put this Islamic calligraphy in so that you could kind of draw a little parallel to Julie's work and see kind of the abstracted calligraphic element 
Um, again, lovely, glowing kind of painting, breathing with life, the, those layers of, 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 uh, of paint and approach technique. And this is a new piece. They're haunting pieces. And here's a close up. Um, you get a vestigious sense of death as, as if one point perspective of the Renaissance painting had collapsed through a window on the world into a whirlwind of motion. <laughs> I don't know where I got that quote from, but <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> Okay, and here is again um, Julie in the the um, actually Harlem church that she got use of to do the um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art murals in. So she actually executed them here in New York. And, and flew them out to California. But you know, some of, the, some of the interesting parts about this is she actually looked at um, uh, American painters like Bierstadt and, and Church, who did West Coast, you know, did those big dramatic West Coast um, paint, some of those West Coast paintings of, um, you know, uh, the, the great parks and things like that and, and took them and bored them and integrated the, the, the diaspora of the Native Americans, the displacement charts, the change of, of the cities and, and all of that that took place over, over the centuries. And those are kind of all integrated into the into the imagery of these pieces. So um, there's a Annenberg uh, lecture with Julie. There's there is um, one from Crystal Bridges, which again is interviews with her. Um, there's also the. Uh, um, a curator from uh, the Whitney that that talked about putting together the show and um, and her interaction with Julie. Um, so this is uh, this is it for this week. I I think I'd recommend highly that you get to go and see the show. Uh, they still have timed entry, so you have to call and make reservations. But it's fairly easy to do, you know, like the day before or two before you're going in. Um, you can even do a day of, but you're taking chances when you do a day of. Um, so they have time to entry and all of that. Um, let's see. The next program. Yep. In, in two weeks, we're going to be doing uh, Kasama uh, at the at the Botanical Gardens. Uh, that that show is going to be on. In, into September, so you have time to get to go see that show. And uh, unless there are any other questions, um, we're good. That that's about it. We're good. Thank okay. you all for coming. I think that's it. <laughs>